I guess for now, if anybody wants to take a crack at this while he sets it up, I guess just unmute and say your name, and then we'll go. I like how we have two Matt Sweeney's. Rick, do you have it to where nobody can unmute? Oh, there we go. Josh, unmute. Go, Josh. Hey. Um, all right. So you could stop uh, the America the A321's climb, and then let the if you knew that Cargolox was going to overtake him, then you could let him just climb over him. That is one option. That is correct. Um, and that is more of a, I would say, a at least in this current spot where they are still in approaches airspace. This is Miami approach, uh, and they own surface to 16. So this is still kind of a Miami approach deal. And yes, Miami could stop this American um, and let the cargo looks come over. However, just because it's crappy climbing doesn't mean it's slow. So the Airbus 321s go very fast. They basically climb out at about 320 knots, um, but then have like a vertical rate of about 250 feet. So while that is an option and it's not a, a bad option, there's, there's a better option. Let's see if anybody else has it. So if anybody wants to raise your hand and go for it. Anybody? Okay. Oh, there we go. Toby, go. Maybe just uh, turn the American from my diversion courses, let the cargo legs climb above them, and they'll you know, have the separation that they need. Save that one for the next situation. <laughs> That's coming up, uh, but yeah. So we'll just we'll just answer this one here because the next situation will cover basically what Toby said. So, if you think from a terminal departure controller's point of view, you know that your back guy's faster, right? So, if you're both gonna you're gonna climb both these guys to sixteen thousand and they go to center. In this case, what happens if uh, you lose comms? Right? Again, not a thing that's gonna happen a lot of the network, but what happens? Uh, you know, if we're going to talk about real world stuff, what's going to happen if, if you lose comms, right? You haven't put speeds on anybody. You're, you're just letting them climb out. The 7.4 is going to run over the American. And you know that that's a problem. So you have a better performing aircraft in the back. So the answer that I was mainly looking for is that you should be calling as departure and getting higher from center. It's a thing that I don't see a lot of people do on the network. Um, getting higher or lower in certain cases uh, is always an out. I think Chris will agree with me here, and same with Drew. Yeah, I will. That. And that being said, lost comms, I mean, VATS and pilots mess up frequency changes all the time. Let's not sugarcoat it. True. <laughs> so, I, you, know. you know, they could, you, you, you'll you often get guys that have been level at the top of your approach controls airspace for 20 miles before they talk to you. Yeah, and that's, you know, as, as a departure controller, that's your deal because you didn't solve the situation. You didn't slap a speed on anybody. You didn't assign uh, a heading around it. You kind of just let it happen. So... In this case, just call and get higher on the cargo legs. He's going to outclimb the Airbus all day. Yep. And that'll solve your problem. You know, he wants 38. The Airbus wants 32. He's never going to never going to be a factor. So, yep. and and getting to getting back to aircraft performance, um, kind of knowing knowing the fact that a lot of heavy aircraft may not be able to maintain 250 below 10, which is perfectly acceptable if that's their minimum clean speed. So, kind of be aware that you know if you have a slower guy behind, you can also as a as a departure controller. Uh, proactively assign the back guy 250 till advised, keeping in mind he's going to climb steeper, but he'll climb slower across the ground as well. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, let's see, what else did I have for this? Um, alternatively, now, if you want to look at it from a center's point of view, um, like Toby said, you can get a turn, and I think I have that on my next slide here. Uh, no, nope, not yet, but that's fine. Um, let's do that. Oh, let's not do that. Hmm. Whoops present okay uh so yeah you can either turn however the turns from a departures point of view will require coordination because now they're coming out uh differently than what the loa states um which requires a call and if you're busy and you're saturated like you most of the time you are here on, on events on the network um it's kind of a waste of call so you can call as a departure and request higher that's another option if you, you don't have to wait for the center to initiate it as well uh, okay, on to situation two. This is more of a question. How many people think that these two aircraft are separated right now on the en route environment? If you think they're separated, raise your hand. Uh, 
don't know. How do we explain to people how to raise hands? Rich. Rick. Let's see Richard. But he's just muted. There we go. Um, I believe it's under more under their their meeting. Or let me just open the chat. Yeah, the chat they can do it. Let's let me have it so everyone can chat that we each other here. There we go. Somebody raised their hand. Yep. Oh. Had it there. More. Oh yeah, there you go. Chat. I forgot to enable polling. There we go. Looks like a couple people are, are figuring it out. But um, from an in route point of view, these aircraft are separated, even though they're inside of a five mile bubble. And I'll explain why here. Um, terminal radar controllers operate under different rules. Uh, obviously, they have a better radar, I wouldn't say better, but a different radar site. It spins faster, so you get more accurate targets. A lot of the time, they now have um, the mosaic type radars uh, and fusion, so they have even more up to date radar than we do. Um, in this area, at least real world, it is a five mile area. Just slightly up here, it becomes a three mile. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving or not, but um, it becomes a three mile. So, five miles for us, these two are technically not separated. However, from the terminal into the uh, in route environment, they are separated. Uh, you got to check on here. And yep, yeah, and ADSB, yes, good point, Brad. Uh, ADSB is also in Fusion. So those are you know, real time updates. Um, and if we go and take a look here at the 7110, 554, when you transition from terminal in route, uh, it's three miles to five. So another thing that um, I don't know if really discussed much in the network, but you can feed en route three miles in trail, provided that there's a form of separation that will cause it to be five miles by the time it leaves the first center sector. Um, again, it doesn't really happen much on, on Vatsim because it, you're not sectorized enough to where it really matters and you're gonna build that separation, but just to keep it in mind. Uh, and the rules involved with that, you gotta have a diverging route or course. The leading aircraft is or, uh, and or the leading aircraft is and will remain faster than the following. In this case here, the 7-4 will be faster, so that rule doesn't apply. Uh, separation constantly increasing, the first center controller will establish five miles or other appropriate form of separation, at which point it will most likely be altitude. Um, and then it's covered by a letter of agreement between, uh, for example, Miami Approach and Miami Center. And then if, uh, just so you know it's legal, at the bottom here, uh, an angular difference of 15 degrees is considered a correct application of the passing or diverging rule. Terminal has seen them now diverge on the 15 degree headings, so you're good to go. And I think I have, I thought I had a slide there with the headings, but basically this American's on a 320, this Cargo X is on a 335, they're gonna be separated, and within two minutes, basically, uh, you will have your separation outside of the five miles. Now, if you do anything other than climb the planes, if you make a turn and they're inside the five mile bubble, it is now your deal. So just be aware of that. Kind of just let the situation run out. Um, a lot of the times, I think everybody, like Chris and Drew, will agree with me that over controlling is a big thing. Everybody's like, let's turn planes 50 degrees left to right to try to get the separation. It's not really needed. 15 degrees over time, especially with a fast plane, will work. So don't over control the situation. You still want to make it efficient. You don't want to add to complexities elsewhere. Who knows if you have traffic coming out this way? I think I can. I thought I was able to annotate on this. There we go. So if you have another plane, like for example, we run planes out this way and this way. So if this cargo lux, for example, if he was here and was given a turn this way, whatever traffic you've got over here, you're going to have issues with. So 15 degrees takes them out of this departure gate here, which is also a departure gate for Miami. They run this way. But you can coordinate with your departure controller to make sure you don't have anybody there and solve it. And, and, if you do, you can make a, a solution. Stop them low or do something else. But you don't want to overdo it. Is what I'm, mainly the, the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, don't over control the situation. It's kind of a thing that I've noticed a lot while I'm here. Uh, let's go. We'll move on to our next fun situation here. Uh, so 
this is the thing that more or less happens real world. There's not a lot of people that fly slow planes uh, on the network. There are a few, not as many. Um, but we can take a look here. We've got a King Air. This is the route of flight. Both aircraft, the, the URM line there, that's the route of flight. Both aircraft on the same route. Um, and you had a King Air depart, we'll say, off of Fort Lauderdale Executive down here. Slow climbing, very slow. He's only doing 200 knots over the ground. And a jet comes out three, four minutes later uh, behind him. Obviously, approach isn't going to think about separating these two because it's not really their problem. Um, so in a case like this, what do you guys think is the best situation to keep separation between these two aircraft? Who wants to give it a shot? Eric Quinn. OK, go ahead. <laughs> this doesn't really count, too, because you're real world, but go. Also, all right. Do you have a mic working there? Eric, you're unmuted, so you should be able to talk. OK, anybody else? His mic's not working. Nobody else wants to take a crack at it? Oh, All right. In chat if you so desire. Oh, is it in chat? You can if you want. The, the, the answer you can put in chat. Oh, yeah, that works too. I have it set to everyone now. There we go. Click participants at the bottom. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll just talk about it. Um, so, like Toby brought up earlier, you can always stop the King Air somewhere lower and let your better performing aircraft climb over the top. This exact situation happens multiple times a day in my airspace. This is my airspace down here. It happens all the time. Uh, your King Airs, your Pilatuses usually don't, uh, aren't too slow and don't climb too bad. But your turbojets, I'm sorry, your turboprops, your, your small turbojets like your Phenoms, your uh, Premier Jets, your Beach Jets, they don't climb great. Um, they're also very slow. So even though they're a jet, they're in the way. So in a case like this, we can stop 6 Delta Romeo. I think you know, I have it on the next slide. We can stop him at like something like 17. You want to keep him going. Uh, you don't want to keep him low, because the lower you keep him, he's just going to become a problem with more and more aircraft. Um, I obviously didn't build it here, but planes off of Palm Beach will come up like this and out it this way. They climb to 10,000, right? So in this situation, we now have a guy kind of in the way. They're either going to come up this way or they're going to get turned. So again, you're going to have to stop a departure here for this guy who's slow and low. So you obviously want to keep them going. However, you can't let them go too high because now stuff coming out this way causes issues like this southwest. Um, we don't have a VRI function here on the network, but real world, um, what we'll be able to see is we can see like a climb rate and it'll look something like this. Uh, this is a two minute leader line. <coughs> Excuse me. So you know that in two minutes, at his current climb rate, he'll be 4,000 feet higher. So it'll be 20,000. So this would work out fine. Um, and you can use that tool. Again, not a thing we have on the network here, but. Uh, One of the things you can do on the network is we know that VRAM updates once every two position updates, and a position updates five seconds. Really, we get 10-second hits on VRAM. We get 12-second hits real world. So what you can do to judge a guy's climb rate is on the network, figure out how many hundreds of feet he changes per radar hit and multiply it by six. Correct. Real world, we do it by five. On the network, you do it by six. So if it changes by 400 feet, you know he's doing 2,400 feet a minute. Yeah, and that's uh, the old school way of doing it before we had this VRI function. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good point. I was going to bring that up, but thank you. Um, so yeah, in this situation, we know that they're good. We stopped the King Air. And then we basically climb this King Air reference to Southwest. Um, so yeah, there's that situation. Anybody have any questions so far about anything I've touched on uh, or any of these situations that you think you might have a better solution to? Go ahead and raise your hand or put it in chat. All right, we will move on. I guess mainly to the same situation. Another option if uh, it becomes an issue where they're actually a little closer than you'd like them to be. You can always turn them. Um, I kind of paused the scenario at a bad spot when I was making it. But assuming the southwest is a little lower, let's say he's at like 
14 or 13. You just turn him out of the way a little bit. Again, not a really crazy heading. Um, his route isn't on here, so you can't really see what he actually does. But if you were to aim here at CZ, like this guy, um, his route does go to the west. So you just give him a little westerly heading. He was on about a 340, so about 20 degrees. Isn't too terrible. Uh, normally these guys come out a little higher, so it's not a big deal. Uh, just something slight. You want to get them basically to the edge of this bubble. So if you can think of a... Uh, if, you can, if you can make a vector basically hit the edge of this bubble, then you've provided an efficient uh, route for him to climb out. Now at this point, if you have them on this vector, both planes can climb unrestricted. There's no uh, separation issue. Uh, so that, again, just providing efficiency is... Uh, is the name of the game here. Let's clear all this off. And I think, let's see, what do I have on this last slide? Yeah, there we go. So like that, basically you make it up. His now new route of flight is over here to the WAC intersection, pushes him way to the west, and this guy just remains on course and climbs. Everybody has uh, a smooth ride up. And the final situation here is kind of a high altitude thing that we've run into real world that uh, has changed because of LOAs and airspace. But something I'd like to bring up to you guys uh, is, are these two planes separated? Um, I'll bring up a route line here. Are they separated in your airspace? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, these are two separate sectors in Miami Center. The boundaries are here. And this is Jacksonville Center right up here. Um, however, is this a good practice? And it's something that does occur on the network occasionally, um, especially between when it's three center sectors on a border. I saw yesterday, I just went watching Minneapolis. This is bad practice. We have two aircraft climbing to 37. One is faster, um, but you can't guarantee that. And they do come together eventually up here at a point called VIA. Um, if you can avoid a situation like this, please do. You have a bunch of different options and ways out of this. You can always see if this guy can go higher. If he can take 39, that's cool. This envoy, he's an E-145, crappy aircraft again. Uh, you can either stop him at 35 and let this JetBlue run over him over the top. Uh, you can stop the JetBlue. Um, again, there's multiple different ways. You can even vector if you really want to, but that's less efficient. Um, however, the main point I'm trying to get across to you guys is don't screw over your neighbor. I know that sometimes they screw you over, but don't screw them over because in the end, the work has to get done. So try to find solutions to problems like this creatively. Altitude, vectors, maybe a shortcut down the line. Eventually, these planes do diverge later on. Uh, by LOA, we can't give them anything worse than VIA or anything farther rather down the line than VIA. <clears throat> so uh, just think of like some sort of creative solution. Coordination can solve anything. I think you'll hear that from us a lot. A lot. Is that you yeah. can coordinate anything. Um, not, you know, you're not limited to coordination. Um, Eric, Eric makes a good point in chat as well, actually. Run your sticks, yes, too. This is true. I, I realized when I was making him, like, hey, he's probably going to overrun him. But that's irrelevant. It's mainly just this point is what I'm getting at, where they combine. Right. Um, but, Yeah. Um, another thing I guess I should have, I should mention too is speed. We haven't really touched about it too much. Uh, is speed control in a case like this? You can ask him his speed. Uh, let's say he's doing seven eight. I don't know. This envoy is probably doing seven four seven two somewhere in that range. It's about a thirty knot difference, basically indicated when they get up there at thirty seven. So he'll probably blow by. Yeah, no issues. Um, and I guess I didn't mention that too while we were lower. Uh, like I was supposed to, but speed control um, is definitely a thing that I don't see enough on the network, at least from a departure standpoint. You can assign speeds to planes coming out of approach. You can assign speeds climbing out. There is no restriction on assigning speeds. Have a fast guy, you've got you know, somebody leading the pack, give him 300, 310 in the climb. When he transitions, give him 78, 79, 80, something fast, keep him going. And then from there, you base your following, your, your following aircraft, you base your restrictions on that. So if a guy's a little close, you can give him, you know, 280 and then try to keep that 280 on the line. Maybe you want to increase space between two planes that are already separated, but you want to make it a little tighter. 
280, 290, 280, something like that. Um, but speed <clears throat> control is something that will save you guys a lot and it's just not used enough. Yeah. Uh, so the idea, the idea is you want to be proactive with it. You want to find it before you're trying to panic fix a separation problem. And that's yeah. kind of the biggest thing that we run into is that a lot of what we do on the network, especially during events is reactive rather than proactive. And that's where if you're, if you're fixing it as you're six miles decreasing to five, you're too late. Exactly. I mean, sometimes uh, it just, just so happens that, you know, maybe the plane turns, the winds are pretty strong and they slow down or somebody just decides to slow down. It happens. Uh, just know, you know, you, you can always put speeds on somebody. It'll, it'll solve a problem temporarily. Obviously you want to establish a better form of separation. Um, speeds yeah. can be, especially on the network, completely different than what you think they are. Yeah. Um, and even real world too. Planes lie. Yeah. But yeah, um, can, yeah, can I throw something in on altitude too? We're talking about, you know, see if the jet look can take 39. I'd look at this and go, if he's able 37, he's definitely able 35 or 36. True. So, if you're if you don't have time to consider it or play twenty questions, or your frequency's just absolutely a a mess. Stop them at thirty five, or if you got nobody the other way, stop them at thirty six and coordinate a wrong way. If you have time to coordinate it wrong way at thirty six, so yeah, that is a good point. They're never going to hit at altitude. If you have a thousand feet, they're never going to hit. Especially yeah, the envoy is already on top, so the jet blue is the one that's climbing up. So yeah, thirty five is always safe, and again, we'll do this you know real world all the time. If we can't get them up, we can't get them up. You can always pass the buck down to the next controller and especially somebody like Jacksonville. Um, this is just, you know, a real world thing. We're very limited on where we can go from Miami to Jacksonville this way and this way. However, Jacksonville can literally go in any direction they want. And I think Chris will agree with me. They, they just send planes wherever. <laughs> um, so let them solve the issue. They have the airspace. They have the ability to shortcut, let them do it. Obviously everybody's LOAs are different. Um, know your LOA, know what you can, what you can't do, where your shortcuts can go. Shortcuts save you a lot. Um, they can basically stop situations from happening long before. Um, I don't know if I can share this screen here. Let me, let me flip screens onto the ERAM. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yep. Okay. Let me turn on my high map. So, uh, let me see, can I annotate over there? I think, no, I don't know if I can annotate on that side. But uh, a lot of the times we have departures come out. You guys can see the mouse, correct? Yep, you can dot .ff to draw fixes in VRAM too. That's true, that I helps. can. That's a fair point. So guys coming out, for example, I guess I can do more than one at a time. Uh, the main route out for Miami is Winko Cherry Smells. Uh, we're coming out Thunder. And then out to Smells or Cape Paso, which is up at the top. Um, a lot of the times, somebody like an Envoy, like a 145, even the Brickyards, the 175s, again, not great aircraft. Um, we'll let them run on the departure. Anybody that comes out faster, they can basically just take a little right-hand jog to Smells or Cape Paso uh, and climb right over. And they're pretty much never a factor with these low guys. Um, in a situation like that, you can go, you know, Winko, Smells. It gives you a little bit of miles. It's it's like eight miles basically over here, and it's good. Thunder, K Pasa, Thunder, Smells, something like that. You don't have to let them fly their whole route. Um, I don't. A, a lot of pilots seem to think that they must be on their filed route all the time, and it's wrong to be taken off it. But shortcuts is everybody's best friend. I don't understand why people don't like to do it here, but um, always provide shortcuts as best you can. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I wanted to talk about. I don't know if I had anything. Drew or Chris or uh, Brad, if you have anything you'd like to add. Brad actually had to bail. Um, okay. One of the things that he, he left me in chat, though, before he got out of here was to pass out is uh, if a turn points an aircraft at another aircraft and they will pass separated, uh, or sorry, if they're already separated and a turn points one guy at where the other guy is now, they will stay separated. Correct. So that's something to keep in mind as well. The, if you're going to vector, point the guy that you want to get in trail at the guy he's following. Yes, that it, they will never hit if you do it that way, unless they're incredibly fast. Yep. Um, yeah, it's a good point. Chris, do you have anything you want to add? 
or Drew anymore? Chris, you are muted. Um, not particularly. You guys have been hitting on most of the stuff, and I'll probably elaborate a little bit more on once we get to the arrival portion. Yeah, his his arrival portion is just straight black magic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, departure is not very glamorous. Um, this is pretty much what I do every day, just put people in lines. Uh, it's not as fun as running an arrival stream or doing some entered sequencing. So uh, if anybody, I don't know how... Uh, Rick, how do you want to do this? Have questions now or wait till the end once we're all done? Uh, based on how much is going on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute every, or allow everyone here to unmute themselves. And if they want to ask a question uh, or have a discussion on something, they can. So if you want to ask something, you can now unmute yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself now. If you want to do that, um, you should be able to do that on your participants window. Just unmute yourself. Or Alt A, I believe. Yeah, or yeah, not, just, on yeah, the, or just on the bottom toolbar too. Yeah. And if your mic's not set up properly, lower left hand corner, um, there's that up menu. You can click that and set your input set, device. Yep, that's that's true. John, ugh, Josh, Tom, looks like you guys have unmuted. You guys have questions, or are you just testing out the unmute? Uh, no, just seeing how this thing works. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, I don't have any questions so far, but I think this is. Uh, I'm learning a lot, but I'm good. Okay. Uh, well, I guess if nobody has any questions, we'll probably have some here at the end that we can all answer. So I'll pass the buck along to, I guess Drew, who's doing in Yeah. Drew, okay. Jerry, you can kick me off. All righty. Sounds good. All right, guys. Uh, yeah, this will stop another screen share, so we'll do that. Uh, alrighty. So, uh, welcome. Uh, so my, my, we're going to talk a little bit more about, and, and this will probably be a little bit more applicable day to day as far as events where, um, you know, you're feeding the neighboring center, uh, they have an event on, or, you know, you, you're running a crossfire, you're doing something like that. But, uh, for my background, I work, uh, area five at Minneapolis center. So we work, uh, a lot of the overflight stuff. Uh, we do a lot of initial spacing for O'Hare to the east, Denver to the west. Um, we even start spacing Kennedy. So that's the other thing to, to consider is that spacing for a lot of these airports doesn't just start one center away. It can start two, three, four centers away. Uh, so if anybody was here for the, for the ZNY Transcon event, uh, we were starting to put guys on mock numbers out over Iowa for Kennedy. So it's... It's, it's important to remember that the, the further out you start fixing a problem, the easier it is to fix and recognize. So what we're going to cover here is kind of a scenario where, you know, say Denver's got FNO. Um, we've got this little gaggle of airplanes going to Denver, and Denver wants anywhere between 15 and 20 miles in trouble. We're going to shoot for 15 to 20 miles, um, talking about a combination of different ways to achieve it, vectors, speeds, shortcuts. So I'm going to go ahead and... Start these guys moving by a couple handoffs here. Uh, is anybody not able to see the radar display clearly? If it can't, put it in chat, please. Yeah. So, a couple things that I'll hit on here in a second. Let me just, it helps if I actually have that on. I'm going to pause this for just a second because we'll go over a little bit. So, now, a couple things that Geckler mentioned that I want to hit on that are equally important up high as they are down low is know your airspace, know what an airplane can do, know what an airplane can't do, and more importantly in the flight levels, know what your wind is doing. That's probably the biggest factor because you want to know that if you put a guy on a vector, are you putting him into the wind? Or are you taking him out of the wind? Or are you going to speed him up, slow him down? A lot of times you'll put a guy on a heading thinking you're going to gain space, and all of a sudden he'll pick up 60 knots, and now you've got an overtake situation on your hands. So let me show you a route line on one of these guys. So basically these guys are pointed at the O'Neill VOR to start one of the arrivals in Denver by turn on Sid Stars. It's the anchor kipper flow, and the arrival looks a little something like this looks goes down this is yankee i'll turn that on 
and then catfish further down the line. So by LOA with Denver, the furthest we can clear direct on that arrival is catfish. So if I give a guy a shortcut, it doesn't look like it's going to take off a lot, but if you cut down their flying distance by two or three miles, that suddenly turns a 12 mile, you know, it turns 12 miles in trail into 15 in some cases. Um, so if we get this kicked off, first thing we're going to look at is if we want 15 in trail, if I measure off catfish, Wisconsin out front is 225 miles straight line from catfish right now. Air Canada behind him doing roughly the same speed is 244 miles off catfish. So really right now these two are 19 miles in trail. That's perfect. You know, that's even a little more than we need. So we do see, however, that we've got United and Delta roughly tied. We've got these two more that we need to definitely expand a little bit. So first things first is I want to keep the front of the line moving as quickly as I humanly can. So uh, keeping in mind, knowing your airplanes, front aircraft's a CRJ-200, not exactly a speed demon. Uh, you can reasonably expect the CRJ-200 to give you, you know, 0 0.79, 0 0.8 at the best, and that is entirely dependent on wind and temperature aloft. So we're going to go ahead and assign Wisconsin 39-32, Mach 7-9 or greater, and see what that does for speed. The idea being, keep your front guy fast, and we'll go direct catfish because we want him to fly the shortest possible line into Denver Center's airspace. Get rid of these interim altitudes, which Euroscope likes to put in. The other thing to consider is um, one of the most misunderstood things about assigning Mach numbers is Mach's, uh, Mach numbers change with altitudes. Uh, good rule of thumb is for every 0 0.01 Mach, you're going to gain six knots of true airspeed. So it's, you know, if you need to get, lose 10 knots, drop a guy two Mach numbers. You need to lose 20 knots, drop a guy between three and four Mach numbers. Uh, same thing here, Air Canada 1037. Now, the other thing to consider is he's 4,000 feet higher than Cactus 3972. So Mach 0.79 at flight level 340 is roughly equivalent to Mach 0.82 to 83 at flight level 380. So we'll go ahead and assign Air Canada 1037 Mach 0 0.80 and see what that does. And that should keep him roughly about the same as our, as our uh, Wisconsin out front. And the idea is speed control to maintain your spacing, vectoring to gain it. So right now we can already tell we're not going to have enough room between United 587 and United 1274. So at some point, somebody's going to get turned. Now, depending on what airspace you're working, this might be another controller. You might need to get control from him to turn a guy. If you're working all the sectors, you have control. It's not really something that gets to be a problem on the network because typically when we work an event at Minneapolis, one center controller works all of this airspace. So really you have control of everybody. You can start your vectors a lot earlier. Same thing here. Now these three are basically all well spaced already. We want to keep these three together. Keeping in mind that United 1274 is at uh, flight level 280. So if I assign him the same Mach number as Air Canada 1037, at flight level 280, he might not be able to go Mach 0.8. And if he does it, we're expecting it to be anywhere between 50 and 60 knots faster than Mach 0.8 at flight level 380. The other thing to consider is he might have less wind. Uh, the jet stream might be different. There's a lot of variables that come into it. En route, en route speed control is all about starting with something, seeing what it does, and adjusting from there. So we want to get... And then once you have your sequence built, get everybody in a straight line. So Air Canada 1037 and United 1274, we've made the determination. That's aircraft one, that's aircraft two, that's aircraft three. Let's get them all direct catfish or, and moving in the shortest possible distance to where we're metering off. And now, meanwhile, United 587 and 1799 are now basically in our airspace. We can start making a plan for them. 
So I'm going to pause for a sec and let's talk about our options. So in the chat or show of hands, left turns or right turns, what do we think? I mean, assuming, say, let, let's say wind is negligible in this case, let's talk about which way we want to go. We're keeping in mind that eventually they're going to either go direct O'Neill, direct Yankee, or direct Catfish for the sequence. The idea is you don't necessarily want to be doing wide S turns across your entire sector either. Chat back up, just give me a second here. All right, um, show of hands or unmute if uh, anybody wants to throw in ideas on how we want to vector these airplanes quick. Uh, let's go with Brett, since uh, Eric's a real world guy, and we'll get his we'll get his feedback on that. But uh, go ahead, Brett. So, what are you talking about, Brett? Hello. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'd probably turn him right. Okay. Um, just because uh, I feel like it'd be easier to get them online and uh, sure. sequence that way. Yep, and what do we just talk? And we talked about it a little bit in the previous sequence. If you turn him at the guy you want to follow, you're never going to run him over as long as the speeds are compatible, right? And right now, you know, the speeds are mostly compatible. You know, assuming what our prevailing wind is at altitude, typically this time of year, it's out of the west. If we turn him out of the wind, he might pick up 10, 20 knots. But if we give him enough of a vector. Um, 20, 30 degrees right, that shouldn't be a factor. And then when you turn him right back in, he'll go right back into the wind and fall right back in line. So, yeah, I, I would agree that a right turn, unless one of the other real world guys wants to disagree or dispute that. So, we'll go ahead and unpause. And we'll start with 20 degrees right. Doesn't need to be severe. So we'll go 20 right on United 587, which should put him somewhere about here. So it's kind of going to be pointed towards United 1274 as one minute leader, but there's enough space here that it should work. The other things to consider right now is United 1799, United 311, and Delta 1708, we need to make space. We need to start slowing the back of the pack down. So if we're running 0 0.79, 0 0.8, point 78.79 whatever oops if I turn the right guy do that um, so really keeping in mind that one mock number is approximately six knots really we want to knock off anywhere between 20 and 30 knots from everybody in the rest of the pack so we can kind of assume based on 0.79 at 34 he's probably doing 0 0.8 so if we assign 0.75 that should start working in our favor. So we'll go ahead and assign United 1799 Mach 0.75. Now, just a speed's probably not going to work either. So what we could do here, we got 20 right here. If we go 30 to 40 right, we can start fanning United 1799 out and kind of basically shooting for this gap here. Delta 1708 is probably going to need some kind of vector as well, but just because he's basically tied with United 311. So right now, if I had to build this sequence, one, two, and three are good. Here's four, here's five. Just because United 311 is already closer in trail, United 311 is probably six, and unfortunately, somebody's always kind of gets screwed over when you're starting to build space here. Delta 1708 is probably going to need something like an S-turn, so probably a southbound heading, 210, 220, 
and then back to join the pack. So we need to start that. So we'll start United 1799. If we did 20 right, let's do 40 right for the next guy. I guess one thing to add on to that is if you see this developing where you know the delta is going to need to turn south, uh, you can always start it early. You can have the previous controller, hey, put this guy on a 180 heading, request him on a 180, 185, 190, something like that. Just get him started. Yeah. So that way you don't have to wait till he gets into your airspace and you've lost another three minutes of sequence time. Right, because three minutes at eight miles a minute, he's now 24 miles closer to your border. And that's exactly what Ryan said. You've now lost time. These guys are all doing, you know, 450 knots is seven and a half miles a minute. That's a lot of distance covered really quick when you're trying to, when you're trying to sequence, you know, when you're trying to space. So we can see now we're falling about 30 knots behind, which means every minute we gain a half mile. Every two minutes we gain a mile here, which is good because we run out to eight minutes. In eight minutes, that's where these two guys will be. Really, about the time they hit kind of the, the, the rest of the line, we should be able to run them back direct as long as we keep them on speeds. So... Again, point at the guy that you want to follow. We've got Delta 17s are right, point at United 311. United 311 is going to need something probably to the north again. I think probably a 310, 320 heading is going to have to be what we do here. And then same thing, get them on a speed. And for those that don't know the conversion, uh, every 60 knots basically is one, I should say every 60 knots is equal to one mile a minute. Correct. So if somebody's doing 400 and... Well, just doing 360 knots, right? You know he's doing six miles a minute. So just take the ground speed divided by six. That's how fast they're going in miles per minute. Correct. So compatible speed, compatible speed, compatible speed. Still caught up with this guy. We may need to do something a little more drastic with him. We've got a couple options here. One is add track miles. Let him fly through, give him a vector back, then clear him direct. The other option is slow him down. We don't necessarily want to slow him down yet because we've still got more space to make behind him so we don't want to compress behind either so almost letting him stay fast stay pointed at the guy he's going to follow go through a little bit maybe do one more quick delay vector back to the south works in our favor here but we see that wisconsin stayed fast air canada stayed fast united stayed fast they're all holding their space and we've got a little bit of mileage to play with here. Oh, pretty much. And then also, one of the things, this is a pet peeve, start your handoffs early. You guys don't need to hold on to airplanes till the border. And just because that a plane is flashing and they take the handoff doesn't mean that you have to ship them right away. You can always right. leave them in your airspace. You know, I, Correct. I wouldn't ship this Air Wisconsin until probably a little bit past the Neil. Yep. Um, but you can flash them now. You should be flashing Air Canada. You got nothing to do with them. Basically, the rule that our instructors down here like to teach is that as soon as you're done with the plane, everything's completed. He doesn't need to point out. He doesn't need any other coordination. Flash them. You're done. Yeah, so yeah we, we call it finish the data block. Yeah, we call yeah. it finish the data block. And also, keeping in mind, know your LOA. You know, Denver, with our, with our LOA with Denver, Denver has control for 20 degrees left and right, and any speed adjustments, 20 miles on our side of the border. So really, you know, O'Neill to the border here, 25 miles. When he gets five miles west of O'Neill, so about halfway through the blank circle here, Denver can do whatever they want with him. So, you know, they may have additional traffic on other streams from the north, further down line that they need to sequence that airplane with. We're doing our job as neighbors and getting them the intrail that they're either requesting or we know that we need to provide them, but they have other traffic. So getting this guy shipped and gone is not a bad idea. So looking at our next two that we're kind of watching. 186 miles from Catfish there. Get him out of the way. 
194 miles from catfish there. So we're at eight miles, still on speeds. We're probably going to need to slow him down. So let's go ahead and assign him Mach 0.75 match the guys behind him because the guys behind him are spacing out quite nicely. This is all about seeing what your initial sequencing is doing and then reevaluating and making changes. So again, keeping the principle of point him at who he's following, if we put him back on about a 200 heading now, can I S turn him back? That'll start to buy us even more space. And then theoretically, we have room between each other. These two now are 20-ish miles apart, 21 and a half. So as soon as we clear United 587 direct, we'll be able to clear United 1799 direct. So since United 587 is turning back, we can start to turn United 1799 back towards the southwest now. So if we put them on like a 220 heading, it doesn't unduly delay the back of the pack because, again, we that there's a balance between making sure that we're getting the in-trail we want and not keeping, because really during an event, you might have 10 more airplanes behind that now you're just S turning across the sky. We've now got a decent amount of space between United 311 and Delta 1708. We can start turning Delta 1708 back at his traffic. Do like a 300 heading. but also looking at we're slow here, we're faster here. And again, down low, if he's Mach 0.75 at 34, really 0 0.72 is what we're going to need to assign Delta 1708 to fall back in line. To make sure that those two don't compress. So now we're at two minute leaders. This is the other thing. This is another good technique that you can use is also measure between your leaders because that'll show you what your spacing is going to look like in two minutes. That's a two minute leader. In two minutes, we're going to be 22 miles in trail. So really with the speeds the way they are right now, as soon as United 587 gets to about here, he can go direct catfish and join the line. And then as he gets closer to O'Neill, give him some relief on the speed to match the guy that he's following. So let's go direct catfish. We'll get rid of his heading. And then the other thing to keep in mind on the network, guys don't turn on a dime. They already don't turn on a dime in the high flight levels because they're doing 400 knots over the ground. So on the network, maybe I'd issue that turn here because by the time he gets to here and plugs it in, that's when he'll actually start the turn. And everybody's seen that before. Network pilots take forever to turn. So just to see how we're doing here, we'll do a quick measurement here. So we were 20 there. We're 21 there. So really, if Denver wanted 20 in trail, we're doing a halfway decent job of giving it to him so far. We're 16 and increasing by, I'll just wait for that ground speed. We're increasing by a mile every three minutes. So two minutes, he's got four minutes to go to the border. So we'll be between 17 and 18 at the border there, right where we want it. We got plenty of room here. United 311, these guys can all basically go direct now and we're set. And the way it's going to work out now is Delta 1708 is actually going to be in front of United 311 because we kind of forgot to turn him back. But brings back another thing. Say this guy goes off frequency, you can't get a hold of him for a few minutes. Don't be afraid to adapt your sequence. Because now these two are now nice, nicely sequenced. And as they get closer, all we have to do is give, give relief on the speeds. You know, we don't need quite as restrictive as 7.5. You can go to 7.7, 7.7, 7.8, 7.5, 7.6, 7.7, 7.8. You know, seven, five, seven, six, seven, 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 eight. Get them all to kind of bring back up into that kind of 450 ground speed range, and life is good.
So the idea is, and I'm sure at some point everybody's been told this in radar training, even on here, vectors to get the mileage you need, speed to maintain it. That's the biggest principle that we don't see used enough. Don't be afraid to pull guys 30, 40 degrees off. Usually on the network, it's a big sky. They're not going to hit. You've got all kinds of room to play with. The big difference that we'd have real world is while all this is going on, there's traffic going everywhere else. There's opposite direction guys. They got to worry about making merging target calls on. There's other westbound traffic that isn't included in the spacing that you've got to worry about keeping these guys apart from because, you know, from 32 up to about 38, that's where all your airliners are. So it's not always a case of all you have is traffic going to the one field. It is on the network a lot because that's just the way the flow of traffic is. So this is somewhat realistic for the network. So that's about what I've got. We can let this play out however long you guys want to watch it. Otherwise, uh, I'll open it up to questions and we can unmute or if uh, Ryan or Chris or anybody else has anything else to add as we go. Yeah, I would say just to add on, especially on the network, uh, I wouldn't limit yourself to just being on one arrival. For example, that Delta, like he got screwed over hard if we didn't, you know, if the United stayed on course. You know, there, the other arrival into Denver down there, the uh, Coho, you can always, or whatever the equivalent one is, Wahoo, yep. you yep. can always reroute over there. And it yep. causes, and that starts down here over Walbach. Correct, yeah. And, and that'll help save, I mean, maybe it's a couple more track miles for the pilot, but he's not going to get spun halfway across your sector. Correct. So just be... Uh, be aware that you can always do reroutes. Yes, it's a little harder on the network, but it is an option. So just be aware of that. That usually solves a lot. I, I do it a lot of the time into Minneapolis, uh, especially working uh, on the north side with the killer and the muscle. I'll usually reroute guys out of Chicago over onto the muscle. It's, it saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of spinning. Same, it just creates less headache. So yeah. don't be afraid to reroute if the options are there. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we have the luxury of airspace in Minneapolis. There's a lot of sky to work with. You know, the Northeast, parts of California, NorCal, SoCal, you don't always have the vectoring room. Uh, you work with what you're given. 40, 50 degree turns in my airspace are not unheard of. Some places you hear a guy give 40 left, 40 right, that's usually because he's going to hit something. <laughs> so um, what we're teaching you here has to be adapted to match the airspace and the procedures that you have. But generally, the principles work the same everywhere. It just might not mean that you get them into effect as quickly if, you can only, if you're only limited to 20 or 30 degree turns. All right, so everyone, if you want to ask a question, feel free to unmute. We can go from there. Yep, if anybody anybody yeah. has suggestions for United 311, because right now it looks like he's only about four or five miles behind Delta 1708. I'll take, I'll take suggestions based on what we've learned. Want about the Delta? Yeah, I can live with that. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and turn 311 back towards the uh, the arrival track, and right. then uh, feather them back in behind 1708. All right, let's start with 20 left and see how that does. We happy with the speed, or you think we can pick up Delta 1708 at the same time to give us some help on the other end? Yeah, I'd go ahead and increase 1708. There's plenty of separation now. Okay. So we'll pick them up by, you know, that'll pick them up to hopefully about 430. We'd actually probably even go to Mach 0.78 and get them all the way up to 440, 450. Um, I have a question about speeds and altitude. What would, uh, being a uh, capability of aircraft at altitude, uh, I know it varies, but what would be a, a good speed to target at where you wouldn't want to go any below, anywhere below that speed? You're going to start, unless it's a heavy aircraft, like a 7.4, 7.6, uh, you're going to start getting unables if you go faster than about 0 0.82, 0 0.83, and generally slower than about 0 0.7. Is, so that's kind of 0 0.7, 0 0.72 to 0 0.8, 0 0.81 is probably the range that everybody can fly and I'll let, you know, I'll let Chris or Ryan or one of the other guys chime in, but that's in my experience, you'll kind of see in that range and it changes depending on how hot it is in the summer. They can't go as fast in the winter. They can go faster. Uh, the wind is different effect, but really if, if you're in that 0.72 to 0.82 range, that's probably what you're going to be living in most of the time. Yeah, thanks a lot. 
Yeah, if I could add to that slightly, can you hear me now to start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. Um, yeah, like so, just with the speeds, I mean, typically seven four and sometimes seven three are all that I'm ever seeing being assigned. They can do seven two generally, but that's going to be mostly just your like your little guys, your Embraers and uh, the like the one forty fives and the the little tiny regional jets will be doing seven two. But I'm not, I haven't really seen anything assigned lower that. And on the high side. Um, same thing. It kind of depends what it is. Regular airliners, 80, maybe 81. Um, but until you get into like the the seven eights in particular, the seven fours, um, and the corporate traffic, they can do they can do quite a lot more. Sometimes I've seen even seven four eights being assigned eight four or better, um, like hawkers and falcons and stuff, eight six or better. So yeah. it, it all depends on who it is. But generally, you can count on everybody to be able to do. Seven four to seven nine. Anything outside of that, it kind of depends. But those should all be almost a guarantee. Yeah. At this point here, would it be um, beneficial to turn three eleven at seventeen oh eight, and that'll that's put them in trail about right when they uh, when he joins the. Uh, so the that's that's what eight minutes looks like right now. Hmm. So, you know, four minutes looks about like that. In four minutes, there. Yeah, that's a little. That's not right. I think that measured off United's data block. Let me move United's data block out of the way. But four minutes looks like this. Twenty-four miles in four minutes. Okay. So I think that's, we're. I think we're good. Yeah, I haven't used that technique before. You yeah, measure. that's 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 one of the, yeah exactly. Measure off where they're gonna be, not where they are. That's the biggest thing. It's you know, it's in route sequencing is 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 never about where they are now. It's always about where they're gonna be. So it's leader to leader. Correct. Okay. Anyone else? Josh, go for it. Yeah, just a question about like on the network with um, the you know, people have different simulators, that like simulation issues, and they have different weather and stuff. Is this, uh, is it almost, uh, does that almost make it more difficult than in the yeah. real world having to Absolutely. deal with that kind of stuff? Absolutely. So that's, uh, and I was going to touch on that kind of as, a, as an afterthought. Everybody's worked an X-Plane user whose sim's running at 15 frames <laughs> a second, and he's moving half speed over the ground. Everybody's moved that one guy that you assign him 0.8, and he's, you know, 40 knots slower than the guy in front of him assigned 0.75. Uh, the wind is getting better. I think the biggest thing that happened is everybody's kind of moving towards, if you can't afford active sky, there's free weather engines. A lot of people are installing them. X-Plane has good wind out of the box now. That was a huge deal because as X-Plane gains popularity, the slowdown issue is still there, but that is going to go away from the sounds of it. The next release of X Squawk Box is going to either have some kind of code in it to automatically drop your rendering settings to keep your frame rate above the minimum, or it's just going to straight up disconnect you if it sees four minutes of sustained, sustained slow flight. Um, so there's help coming there, but uh, going back to some of your outs, altitude, you got a slow guy, dump him down to 28 get him underneath the rest of your flow and treat him like he's a turboprop. You got a fast guy. I mean, vector him out, offload him to a different arrival. Uh, maybe you have to just assign him whatever his slowest Mach number is that fits in with your traffic flow. There are ways around it. And, you know, worst case, you just S turn him all the way across your airspace. <laughs> um, there's, there's no good way of dealing with the different wind. You just kind of adapt as best you can. Cool. A Thanks. Lot that's that's to be, don't, a lot of it comes down to be don't be afraid to vector. Eric, go. Yeah, kind of um, on that topic, it, it's kind of weird, you know, in VATSIM world because, like we're saying, these guys, you know, if they're at the same altitude and they're assigned the same Mach number, they should have the same ground speed. But if they don't have active sky or they don't have, you know, something and some other guy does and the winds are strong or something you can see like a 60 knot difference that shouldn't be there and you know 
if they're not at altitude, it's kind of less obvious. You assign something you think is going to work, and it just doesn't. So uh, what I've been doing to kind of deal with it is a, a liberal use of, say, Mach number. Yep. I kind of just adjust from what they're doing because, you know, typically you can you can look at what other people are doing and use that to pick something that seems like it would work, but that kind of doesn't work here. So um, that that's what I do is I just – what is your current Mach? You know, so until 1708, say Mach number. He tells me what it is, and then I give United 311, you know, the same question, and then, you know, you just adjust it from there. If I need him to lose, you know, 40, you know, 40 yep. knots ground speed, I adjust instead of trying to estimate it, you know, blindly yep. from the beginning. Yep, and that comes down, and that, that comes down to knowing that uh, at altitude, 0 0.01 Mach should be a six-knot change. So – uh, if you need to slow, like we talked about, you need to slow a guy 20 knots, drop him between 0 0.03 and 0 0.04. You need to speed a, speed a guy up 30 knots, add 0.05 to 0 0.06. Um, the, the relationship I, I feel like doesn't get touched on enough in center training. And that's one of the huge, as soon as you have the numbers in your head, you can make this all about just hard calculations. I need this guy to slow down by this many knots. I need to pull him back that many mock numbers. Brett, go. Right, you're up. Hello? Yep. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, I guess the one thing that I hope people got out of your session was you don't need to turn people 90 degrees to build space. I think that's a really big problem that I've been seeing is they're like, crap, I don't have the space. Let's get this guy 90 degrees off of what he's got, and then you're 50 miles in trail of uh, yep. the person you're following. So like, yep. just seeing like the small changes – yeah, obviously that fixes so the problem. So we had a rule in CTI school that they learned, and it, it works less. It's more of an approach control rule, but it does work for to a certain extent at the center environment. 10 degrees off course for 10 miles should build you two miles of space behind who you're following. So if I want to build eight miles of space in, in 10 miles of flying, I turn a guy 40 degrees. I want to build four miles of space in 10 miles of flying, I turn a guy 20 degrees. The rule was 10 for 10 gets you two. And again... Wind plays in, aircraft performance plays in, but it's something to start off of. You know, I think the most drastic thing we did was turn Delta 1708 up here from like a 240 track to a 200 track. You know, you know that's a 40, 40 degree turn. That should be enough to do most of what you need to get done if you identify it and catch it early enough. That's the other thing. You notice we picked that up way up here. We already knew kind of what our sequence was going to be. Yeah, it changed here because we left United on a penalty heading for a little longer than we would. And there's times, Matt, some pilots don't read back. They walk away from the computer and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I definitely think uh, maybe that's another thing maybe that goes into center training. We got to, you got to look so far ahead in the center environment. And then I guess maybe people don't do that. And then they're like, Oh crap, I need this really long heading to fix my problem. So. Right. Yeah. No catching and identifying the conflicts early is the, is the name of the game. Absolutely. And you know, we already said, I'm going to make this guy one, this guy two, this guy three, this guy four. You make a plan and then you, you, you execute, execute the instructions right. that you need to make your plan work. And if it doesn't work, you change the plan. So I'm actually kind of glad that this happened where we had to swap these two out because it gave you a good example of, hey, sometimes it doesn't always go the way you want to plan. Anybody else? Rick, you want to just generally unmute and let people kind of just chime in for a little? <laughs> and there you go. There's, there's the there's, party line. And there's what we shipped to Denver when all was said and done. They want to unmute themselves, they can, since, you know, people. <laughs> uh, I think we've hit everybody's question. We can, we'll touch again on more stuff in the, on the next one, so. Yeah, so, uh, Chris, your turn.
Alrighty. We got ourselves a little bit of Atlanta space right now. Um, what you guys should be seeing is the uh, this is a southeast arrival for uh, Atlanta. Um, the Sith Two arrival for all Star Wars nerds out there. Um, we're just gonna work with a east stop today because it's a little bit easier than our uh, west stop. But right now we got a whole bunch of different ties. Our first set AC one twenty three and Delta six or uh, seven sixty eight. They're basically tied right now. Um, there are a couple different ways to fix things for the first two, but uh, since it's so close into a fix, and if you were trying to give approach five miles of trail, uh, you basically have to vector. Um, didn't catch this one early enough, or you're just too busy working on other things. So this is a situation where you probably vector. Um, for this particular sector, the eastern arrival stream up here is usually the ones that get vectored uh, to join the straight ends down here. Um, that's going to be basically what's going to happen with this uh, these first two pairs. After that, um, we can see this back AC 5331, Frontier 423. They're also wired going into the Sith, so we're gonna have to do something with them. Since we catch this one out a little bit further, uh, we're gonna work more with speeds and let them work and see what it takes to uh, match them. And then uh, finally, these last four, uh, basically the pair of four deltas, is gonna need a combo of a little bit of everything, speeds, vectors. Um, this is more your last line of defense from the en route position going into an approach control. Um, this scenario is going to run them a lot more tight than most FATSIM controllers are going to be comfortable with going into a uh, approach control. We're probably going to aim for around five miles between each pair, um, hopefully more, but we can use three going into Atlanta in the real world if we uh, ask nicely. Um, but for the time being, to fix these first two, we're going to take this AC, bring them down to the southeast, and to make sure this works to help your cause, since you can't do it just with speeds, you got to turn and do speeds. Um, we're going to speed this guy up, do 310 or better, slow this bad guy back to uh, 280, just so he doesn't have to slow all the way back down to 250, which would be very egregious for... Uh, a west stop or an east stop rather but ac 123 we're going to speed 280 768 speed 310 or greater and the ac 123 to get them pointed in the right direction 230 or 240 heading i'm going to choose a 240 heading That was a very solid use of the upside down keyboard there. If anybody caught that. Uh. <laughs> yeah, class. <laughs> yeah, this keyboard is not the same as uh, what I use at work. So I'm a little, little rusty with that. Let's see what we got. What? 310, Raider, 4, 5, 6, 8. So that's what we're going to do here. And since these two are basically pointed right at each other. We're gonna use altitude separation, so AC. We can go down to 18, because uh, he's out of 17. And since he's crossing Sith at 14, that's a pilot's discretion descent. Yeah, what he just said there is huge. This is the one thing that we don't see a whole lot of during during events, where there's a lot of controllers that right now would have AC descending to 14, which is not a positive use of separation. All right, so while we let those first two cook, looks like it's starting to work out a little bit. 
we'll do the next pair. AC5331 in the Frontier here. They're basically tied. He's closer, but he's faster, so we're going to slow him down. Um, his vector line's kind of hard to see, but it's basically wired up with him. So we're going to slow him back to 280. And the other guy... We're going to make him go super, super fast in the descent, mainly 310 or better. But since we want to make sure that this works out, we're going to do 320 or greater. And then even further back, all this stuff is just going to be a mess, but it's all about starting stuff early. So Delta 1983 down the bottom. He is slower than him even though they're about tied there. So slow the slow guy, speed up the first guy. So Delta 7, 7, 8. Speed 310 or greater, 1983, speed of 280. And then these two up here, since they're basically going to be tied with these guys down here, same thing we did up here. Turn them out, go that way. And just one thing to touch on that a lot of this is possible because each individual stream from the sector before it at least came in with some spacing. So kind of what we talked about in the last scenario of we want to make sure that our stream going to the next sector is good because they have other traffic that needs to be merged in. And I guess, I guess also to touch on this is if you have multiple ways uh, into an arrival, like there's like 6 million transitions onto the Sith, you can always put planes on different transitions to make the sequence a little easier. Sure, it'll be tougher down the final, but you'll be able to keep a consistent 20 or 30 per stream, uh, or at least per feeder route into the arrivals. So just keep that in mind as well. All right, so AC-123, he's slow enough where right now we can start bending him back towards Sith to send him to 15,000. Because like we said earlier, bats and pilots can be slow sometimes. So we can kind of lead his turn. Look back again at these two right here. Don't have all that much space, so this guy, AC5331, he's going to have to slow back to 250. Basically, you got to make sure everything works. Down the bottom here, we slap a 280 on him, 310 or greater on him. And these two, we're just going to peel out and slowly, like Drew did in his scenario, once we get our space looking at the vector lines where they're going to be, these two are going to sort themselves out. So right now, my goal is to put these two behind our slow guy, Delta 1983. Because again, this is a good idea of knowing your overtakes. We've got a 380 ground speed on Delta 1983. We've got a 435, almost 440 ground speed on Delta 17, or on Delta 778 which means effectively right now, Delta 778 is almost a mile a minute faster. So in five minutes, you will be fi almost five miles in front of Delta 1983 right now if the speeds hold. And we can start these guys down right now. His vector line ends right in there. That translates to there. So right now we're still looking good. It might be a little bit close, but we can still work on it. Right here, we got good speeds. It might not be exactly five, but by the time they both get to approach, we'll be there.
and since we're getting close on the AC 123, uh, approach would be taking Delta 678 down. This is one place where coordination will help. If approach is good with them descending to 14 and using three miles for them, that's something we can do. If not, APRC at 15,000, give them control for turns, even for more uh, speeds, and they'll uh, descend them when they can. So right here, it's kind of hard to see vector lines, but 1983 and this guy, 1983's vector line is right there and 778's vector line. So if we measure them out in about two minutes, we're gonna have four miles. So by the time we get to the boundary, that'll be plenty. 1983, if we wanna help out the situation, we can descend him to 14, because lower, slower, helps your cause, make sure you don't have to work extra hard once it gets closer. And now looking here, we see his vector lines there, he's there. My sequence is gonna be 778, 1983, 1862, and 657. So at this point, I've got, or I'm gonna have my five miles here, I'm gonna shoot his vector line to follow him, because I know for, just from experience, start bending him to a 260 or 270 heading that's going to cut your miles down and also we can start moving him back that way because we just need 10 to 12 miles behind him for him to fit in well you guys noticed earlier uh with the ac 123 ac 5331 he was descending you know stepping down reference um don't get locked into making everybody descend via. You can start guys down um, to kind of approximate a normal descent. Everybody know, should know the three to one rule. So really, Delta 778, if he needs to hit Sith at 14 with no speed, he's going to need to be out of flight level 240, about 30 to 35 miles away from Sith. So, you know, hanging guys up makes, uh, makes it harder on the pilot, and then they're not able to hold the speed going down because a lot of times if they – you know, if they need to make the altitude restriction, something's got to give. He's going to have to speed up past 280 to push the nose down fast enough to get down. So don't be, you know, don't don't hang guys up any longer than you absolutely have to either. Delta 657, now that we've got more than enough space here, I'm just going to give him direct Sith, and we're going to just worry about more him fitting in behind him. Everybody's doing the same speeds. If I wanted to, I could probably speed him up just a little bit, close this gap, but going into approach control, we're going to try and give them a fighting chance with these last four. Still stepping down, Delta 778 on top of uh, 1983, so we can go down to 19 with him. So from here, looks like we're going to have our spacing here. So 778, we're good there. He can go down to 14. 1862, start bending him even more towards where he needs to go, like a 290 heading or something like that. 657, he's already going to be good to go. We can cross Sith at 14. We want to do a chat survey. What's the lowest altitude we could assign Delta 1862 right now? Delta 1862, since we're good with space behind these guys, direct Sith. If we wanted to, we can start picking his speed back up to maybe 300, tighten up gaps. But if you're trying to make sure that you're not going to overwhelm your approach controllers, you'll try and build a little bit more space.
so in the end, a lot of uh, a lot of this comes down to starting stuff early, um, especially for arrival stuff. Um, me running a scenario by myself and doing all these ERAM entries, um, it's going to be a lot easier because um, all essentially all you're going to have to do is just give the commands to the pilots and update your data blocks. So it'll go a little bit smoother. Hopefully they all do what they're told, but trying to build space, uh, the key, especially for when you're coming down to um, the wire going into an approach control, uh, the key is beginning early. Don't be afraid to vector and basically everybody should be assigned speeds just so that you can make sure that you keep what separation you have going uh, into your approach and don't have massive overtakes. Yeah, the worst thing is to just expect that somebody's going to be flying a certain speed and they're not. And the only way you can guarantee it is to slap speeds on people. So it's very critical that if you're going to do a sequence like this where you're running them tight, you know, five, six and trail, speeds have to be on everybody. There's no other way to do it. And same thing here. You get an X-plane guy with slow rate, dump him to whatever your turboprop altitude is. <laughs> yeah, basically. And, and going into Atlanta for these ones, that's, uh, I don't know, east up, it's 11 yeah. for uh, Canuck, the old fix. Yeah. Right, the fix there. And that's the other good point AJ, AJ brings up is if you're going to slow guys, start with the back if you can help it. If you're going to speed guys up, start with the front make compression work for you. It all depends upon where you want your uh, spacing to start. Um, start affecting if you want something to happen now, obviously do that, but to prevent compression, slow from the back first, speed up from the front first. If you want to compress, kind of do it in the reverse order. And, you know, uh, and that an that's one of those things that 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 applies universally. Approach control, same thing. You need to start building more space on your downwind. Slow the back guys on the downwind first. So some of this stuff is equally applicable to terminal. It it's more magnified at the center because the higher they go, the faster they go. But it certainly applies down low, especially in the final approach airspace. Anybody have any questions? Um, in all the things you did to that sequence, how many times would you have called approach to coordinate something? Um, if I didn't have to type in everything, uh, I probably wouldn't call perch. Um, at this point, with all the, the volume that we have, approach would probably have a speed that they wanted to fix, and then I'm going to either still be descending via or crossing. Um, for going into A80 in the real world, descending via is crossing Sith at or above 14, and there is... Tizzy at maintain 12,000. So basically, if uh, we were descending via, they'd cross Tizzy here at 12. Otherwise, it's crossing Sith at uh, 1 4,000 in the speed. So all that stuff is pre coordinated. So they can expect the same thing every single time um, because of the limitations for a swipe box. It's kind of hard to give people cross Sith at and maintain and have them do it. But to get them doing the same thing every single time going into approach so that they have something predictable uh, is the goal. So on a day like this, it would be 14 and 280 at the fix and probably 10 miles in trail if you had to uh, give them something manageable so that they can worry about compression of their own. Well, the other things you can do to cut down, a, cut down coordination with your approach control is you can apply a speed 
to the point where you where where you meet approach airspace. We do this a lot at Minneapolis where if we're trying to make a speed work, we'll assign descend via, except maintain three hundred knots until fix, then publish your speeds. So that way you're in compliance with your approach LOA at the fix, but your speeds are working for you in your airspace up until then. And that is with with all these OPD arrivals, especially when they have you you know, we're, we're moving a lot towards these ones that start on Mach number, have you intercept 280 knots on the way down and descend. You can still mess with those speeds, just know what your LOA is. So again, going back to those core principles, know what you need to coordinate, know what you don't need to coordinate, and know what you can do in your own airspace. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, I'm going to... We had a, go ahead. a question in the chat. Oh, uh, we for the fourth line entries, um, to update the data blocks, I'm using the QS command. So um, if I were to... Steal this track over here. If I want to update this data block... Um, basically there's two portions. There's the heading portion and then a speed portion. Heading always comes before a slant and then the speed comes afterwards. So, and then the CID 981. Um, for like Drew was putting in the uh, chat below, you can do a combination of the both um, you can put in only a heading, only a speed, put in a heading and a speed. You can clear a speed or clear a heading, and then you can clear them both. Unfortunately, you can't delete a heading and then fix a speed, and you can't delete a heading or uh, the other way around. But uh, basically, it's QS for uh, scratch pad and then three digit heading or I suppose if you wanted to do a uh, direct affix up to four letters that'll put that in the fourth or in the uh, heading portion and then speeds same thing US slant it can be up to four characters um, 310 greater 310 less Mach numbers are Mach 78 or greater 78 less. Um, they don't really transfer well in VRAM unless you're using free text, which is QS and then the uh, tilde or GOV symbol. It brings in the clear weather symbol, then you can do up to eight. Um, right. So if you want to coordinate it across positions on the network, we pretty much have to put it in free text, which is the downside. Uh, you know, real life, those headings and speeds transfer from one scope to the next. Any other questions? Sequencing, ERAM. Alrighty then. All right. All right. So I put in there again uh, the survey to please complete that um, after the class so we can figure out what we need to improve upon for next time, topics for next time, um, rate this course so I can use the feedback to develop other stuff. Um, just before they finish up, I'd like to thank Ryan, Drew, and Chris for their. Uh, their time in developing this and teaching it. And I think we've all learned something and hopefully that at least everyone's learned something new today. So without, I'll let them uh, finish up. Like we, I think uh, one thing I'll end with that we talked about is that these are kind of 
principles, take them and apply them to your own airspace, see what works, see what doesn't work. Um, watching flight aware or flight radar to kind of watch your own major airport during a big busy push, you can kind of see how your local center handles working the traffic in and out of the airspace. So you can kind of see what might, you know, what might work for Atlanta might not work for Minneapolis or LA or San Francisco. Um, and then what works, you know, what works at altitude doesn't work down low. What works down low doesn't work at altitude. So uh, again, you know, this isn't meant to be the be all end all on how to make it work the same way every single time. But after a while you start getting used to what does work and doesn't work in your airspace. And that's kind of, this is just to present food for thought on how to maybe approach those sequencing issues in your, uh, in your own airspace. I got nothing. I think you Chris have touched on everything. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you everybody for coming out. Hope you guys learned something. You can always email us. Um, if you have questions or you email Drew, at least you can get a hold of me. I don't know if my email address is on anywhere anymore. Uh, but you can always talk to us, find us around. Um, we're always willing to help. Um, but we we're glad that we had quite a, a quite a big group of people show up and, and show some, desire to want to learn and get better, which is always good. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks everybody for taking time out of your Saturday, especially yeah. during the holidays. Exactly. And, uh, it, you know, this is the direction we, we really want to try to push the networks toward is, is have people get better by learning. You know, this, this whole network's designed around, uh, learning how to be an air traffic controller. It's not real world, obviously, but you can, uh, you can really learn, uh, just like a real one does a lot, you know, both Drew, Chris and I, uh, Eric, we had uh, Brad in here, all five of us, we're all real world controllers. We've all been on the network. Uh, you know, at least for me, especially, I would have never become a controller without the network. So it's, it's a great place to learn and meet people. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I guess that's pretty much what I'm trying to say is thank you for wanting to learn. Yeah, and even if and even if you know that's not your end eventual goal, even if you don't want to get into the FA or do any of that, you know this is designed to make you better at what we do on the network as well. Which is why it's nice to see thirty, forty people out for something like this because now you take this back. This is recorded. Pass it around to your facilities. You know, use it to kind of for those of you that are mentors, instructors, pass these techniques on to your students. That's how we all get better.